Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. A little later in the program, we're going to do a segment on what it is to be an entrepreneur in Colorado, this time in drive-in theaters. But first, I wanted to talk about politics and the polling that goes on. Who's ahead, who's behind? One of the great pollsters in town. Thank you for being here, David Flaherty from Magellan. Thanks nice for having you. me, John. I appreciate you know, it. I've, I've got so many questions about the, the work you do, not only uh, here in Colorado, but around, around the nation. There's so many different polling firms. It used to be that newspapers used to hire polling firms. They don't do that anymore because they can't afford anything. And so polling really started not for politics, but didn't Gallup start this as to, you know, what, what type of flavor beans do you buy and, and for, for, for commercial use, and then it kind of morphed into politics. Correct. In fact, very long ago for the Doom and Truri, uh, Truri uh, presidential race of 1948, the way that pollsters would call people up and contact them and ask them who they intended to vote for would just be taking phone numbers straight out of the phone book. Um, and they found that, that the media outlets like that, and of course, it's not always right, and it's famously known how uh, you know, Truman prevailed over um, his opponent and when they got it wrong um, back then. Talk to me about the, the mechanics of, of, sure. of polling. Because sure. uh, mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of pollsters, mm -hmm. and every pollster has the formula right, but all of its competitors have it wrong. It's amazing. <laughs> There's no agreement. They're, they're like economists. Well, you know, they're doing it wrong because they're not doing this. The idea is you contact people. You ask them, how do you feel about this? Who are you going to vote for? How do you feel about the economy? How do you feel about the president? That's changed a lot. What's been the biggest change? Well, first you just cover the fundamentals. Um, if you're going to be doing a survey of voters, of registered voters or likely voters, uh, there's two different methods. The older method is called RDD, or random digit dialing, where you're not calling out of a list of voters that you've matched up phone numbers to. You're randomly calling number exchanges and then screening people. When I mean by that, they say, hello, we're calling you this evening from so-and-so research. Are, are you a registered voter? If the somebody says yes, then they go into the survey. And they're calling people you know, based on a randomized set of phone numbers. What we do and what is becoming more prevalent in the polling industry is what's called list-based sampling. Um, we believe that it's more accurate and uh, just there are advantages to getting a list of registered voters. You can buy it from the Secretary of State of Colorado. We phone match that file. There's also a lot of phone numbers on that file, 3.0 million individuals. And then we randomly draw, depending on the survey, 25 to 50,000 names out of that 3.5 million list. And then we call them at random. Um, that's a, a basic way to first through a phone poll. Now, granted, no, I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've heard that you know, when, when they did a phone poll, if, if you had a thousand people in the poll, that was considered to be a pretty big sample size. It is. And I mean, having a 400 person poll is not unheard of, Correct. but really you think about 400 people in the entire state yep. and, and politicians and campaigns and, and advertisers are making their decisions on what 400 people may or may not say. Yes. You know, um, uh, what what is a good sample size for a poll? Well, um, it depends on the size of the population you're trying to measure. Um, for a legislative district that may have 65,000 registered voters in it, you need to realize not all of those 65,000 people are going to vote. Um, if you're looking at you know po folks that are going to be turning out to vote this November, um, 400 n, 500 n, and I mean by n is the sample size um, is a good sample. Um, it is accurate. It is statistically valid. Um, there's different different degrees of margin of error, you know. Um, but for, you know, how about for a statewide seat? Statewide, I'd prefer not to do anything less than 500. Um, in all honesty, it's also helpful uh, to have that many interviews because then you have 250 men and 250 women, roughly, to look and see, are there differences of public opinion within subgroups of voters? But 500 is really preferable minimal size for a statewide right. survey. This, this is what I hear from people. Well, they've never called me. Nobody. This poll is crazy. I've never gotten a phone call. Or I've heard the other thing. This guy called me, and he's asking me these obnoxious questions, so I didn't, I didn't answer. Mm -hmm. And then the third problem is nobody has a phone at home anymore. Correct. We keep it in our pocket. Correct. So particularly younger generations yeah. have no landlines. Absolutely. How, how do you or do you mitigate these, these problems, which, and how do you even know how to mitigate them? Well, we know how to mitigate them several ways. Um, we can cell phone and landline phone match our voter file. In fact, we have a file that actually has every cell phone number in the entire country that we use to match the lists against. 
Um, there's a lot of value. Really? Can, can you give me some girls' phone numbers? <laughs> well, no, we're not in that business, John. It's strictly, there's some money in it. Uh, that we are not in that business. Right, I'm sorry. Think, we'll talk after. <laughs> okay. The difference is there are dramatic differences between folks that have a landline. They are older, they are less minority, uh, they're more white. Um, there's definitely a big difference. And in past election cycles that you've seen, folks that have omitted or not chosen to invest or use a portion of their overall interviews among cell phone will undermeasure traditionally what are Democrat, you know, strength. Because you're right, younger voters are either cell phone only, cell phone mostly, or cell phone completely only where they don't have a landline. And if you're going to be dialing a phone number, you know, because we pay call centers to do this. They may have 30 people at a, your telemarketing center and they're ready to go. You are only allowed by law to upload landline phone numbers and call them without their permission. A cell phone, though, on the other hand, you have to pick up the dialing, you know, the receiver by hand and hand dial that cell phone number if you do not have that person's permission. So it's a little bit more time intensive. It takes more time to interview somebody on their cell phone. So it drives up the cost of the survey. Um, but you really need to look at the demographics or the likely demographics of the population you're trying to measure. Our rule of thumb is we try to shoot for 25 to 30 percent of all of our surveys to be cell phone or landline, um, especially where you're going to have a population that is expected to be much younger, such as during a presidential election, or very Latino or Hispanic. So, so this is where, while what you do looks like a science, there is a fair amount of art to how a pollster chooses what to weigh and why to weigh it. Absolutely. And that's why there's so many differences among pollsters a and why absolutely. you fight all the time. Absolutely. No, and I think the 2012 election was a very clear example of that. Many Republican pollsters projected what turnout was going to be more towards a 2004 electorate and did not think it was going to be the similar of what it was in 2008. Um, that's a judgment call that all researchers have to make. Um, and we use different, you know, streams of data to decide what do we think, you know, the partisan makeup is going to be of this election cycle. Like, it's going to be different this year in Colorado, where we expect it to be somewhere around 38 percent Republican, 35 percent Democrat, and 30 percent or so uh, un independent. We use our voter file and go back and look at the demographics of people that have voted in prior elections that are similar, such as 2010 or perhaps 2006. That data helps us make a judgment call, because we really don't know, um, but you have to make a judgment, especially when, because if you just go out and say, I'm going to call a bunch of landline phone numbers and I'm not going to wait by party at all, you will have too many Republicans in your sample traditionally because they tend to be older. Um, you will underrepresent Democrats. Um, so there's. Each researcher has their own methods. All of them are valid. Um, you know, we, we're not critical of different approaches. Uh, you're either going to get it right or you're going to get it wrong. Let's talk about what you've learned. Now, if you talk to me, how you learn it. Let's talk about Colorado. Sure. You know, I, I can tell you what I feel, and I can feel that over my four decades in Colorado plus, that the character of the state has changed. Mm -hmm. We have become much more liberal, but I also sense a growing libertarian vibe that is social conservative ideas, whether it's gay, abortion, mm -hmm. those type of issues, mm -hmm. marijuana, marijuana yep. um, don't really work, but there, there seems to be a growing tolerance for social issues, mm -hmm. but a leave me alone factor and mm -hmm. stop taxing me factor that seems to be going, but I, but it's changed. So tell me about Colorado. What What is the makeup of Colorado now? What what does the average Coloradan think? Well, it, it, it changes from cycle to cycle. Environments change. When I say environment, I'm saying, you know, if you remember the fall of 2008, the vibe in Colorado, Chloe, was there was utter excitement for, you know, the first African-American president being elected, um, that things were going to be different. They were going to be turning the page. Um, you had an enormous number of younger voters participating in the electoral process that hadn't in the past. You could see it. You could touch it. You could feel it. That does not bode well for a Republican candidate. You could just see it coming. Um, 2010, you all of a sudden see the environment switch to the other way. You all of a sudden find a lot of what you're referring to as just leave me alone. You know, I'm socially, I'm, I'm more liberal or moderate, but fiscally though, I'm really feeling threatened, if you will, by the TARP spending, the legislation that was coming out of Washington. Um, and you almost had a lot of sort of lapsed fiscal conservatives coming out of the woodwork. Um, you could see it in the Republican primary of 2010. Almost one-third of the voters in that primary did not vote in the 2006 primary or the 2008 primary. They're sort of awoken um, because they were very concerned about what they saw coming out of How Washington. important is the national mood to Colorado politics? You know, uh, four years ago, 
the Republican Party imploded on the gubernatorial stage, and it, and it mm -hmm. was just an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. But Republicans won the AG's office, the Secretary of State's office, yep. uh, um, uh, sure. the Treasurer's office. Sure. They as far up as the this House. year, mm -hmm. how? What is the feeling, and how nationally, and how is that going to affect Colorado? It will affect on, on, the, on the feeling of the economy. Um, the economy is tied heavily to federal candidates, such as the president and Congress. Um, whether they're looking to blame with somebody, if, if things are going well um, in the economy nationally, incumbents tend to do better. Um, they don't feel that they're, they're less likely to give a new person a chance or give a new person you know, a, a consideration because things seem to be going fine. Right now, though, in Colorado, from all the research that I've been doing in the last six months, is people are very cautiously optimistic about the economy. They, they know things are doing better. If you ask them, in 12 months from now, do you think the economy will do, you know, be doing much better, stay the same, or be doing worse? You have about a third, a third, a third. Um, they're optimistic, but if you... But guarded. But very guarded. And I think, not to bring up a specific example, but I think Amendment 66 last year it was, a, it was a big sign of that. You know, obviously the folks that supported that initiative were like, it's only $130 per family, and they laid out all the numbers, and it went down overwhelming. Now, largest defeat of a tax increase in, in, in Colorado history. Correct. And, but, uh, you know, but you had you know, a big, big, peop, uh, big numbers of people in Democrat-leaning counties where this should have resonated well, such as Pueblo, you know, where still you had more than 60% saying, no, I can't afford $130 you know, a year. Um, that, I think, is a, is a really uh, shows what the, the mood of the economy is. So it's, it's very tepid optimism. Let me ask you a couple of specifics. We've only got a couple minutes left. Sure. The mood on pot, you know, that we've got this national reputation, has pot been an embarrassment? If, right. if, if that were on the ballot this year, would it, would it still pass? The demographics of the 2014 electorate are different than 2012. The folks that backed the pot, pot amendment, you know, had, were smart to put on the ballot in 2012 because you had more younger voters coming out. But what a big reason that we believe from our research why folks supported pot was local control. Um, giving a local community the right to either ban it or support it or do whatever they wish with it, I thought brought in a lot of voters, as well as it being on the ballot in 2010, or 2012, with a lot of younger voters. 2014 is a little bit different. Your electorate is going to be older. You're not going to have as many younger people participating in the election. Um, I'm not sure if it would pass, and I would probably be very close. But overall, right now, the public mood regarding the pot, it's here. Um, in all honesty, it, it's, it's not dominating. Nobody's outraged about it. It's just sort of there. And Talk to me real quickly. The big races. Let's go. U.S. Senate, yes. Um, uh, governor, and uh, sixth congressional. Real fast, less yes. than a minute. How do those look? Um, the Senate race, in all honesty, is a toss-up right now. Um, every public poll, as well as our own internal polling, shows the same thing. Um, it's within the margin of error. Voters are waiting to do evalu evaluate and, and learn who Cory Gardner is and what he's all about. That, and both campaigns are going to be going out. I think that's going to go down the way. Governor's race, Hickenlooper clearly does have the upper hand right now. Um, the primary needs to shake itself out. Obviously, we won't have any kind of debacles that we did in 2010. Um, but right now, if you had to ask me, who do I think has a better chance of holding on to their office, Udall or, or Hickenlooper, I would say Hickenlooper. Sixth Congressional, one of the hottest seats in the country. I would say it is pretty much a, a straight-up toss-up. There's going to be a lot outside money going into that race. It's a very, very tight district, partisanship, turnout-wise. I mean, it is real close. Uh, the undecided, that, or the uh, unaffiliated voters in that election are really going to decide that race. It's going to be a fun year. Yes. Sir, we'll talk again soon. Stay tuned.